Well, welcome everyone. I'll turn it over to Sue for a few minutes and then uh, I'll introduce our fabulous speaker. If you haven't tuned into anything that Richard Bell has been involved in, I suggest you do so. I've listened to several of his lectures on the American Revolution and anytime I see him come up on anything, I, I tune in. He is a, a wonderful speaker and I think you're really going to enjoy listening to him. Okay, well, um, I just have, I just wanted to welcome everyone tonight. This is the first of our uh, sessions after the new year. So hopefully you all had uh, good holidays and um, we'll be, this is actually the, the third in our series this year. So um, we're moving right along and um, I hope everyone has had a chance to read the book. It's something that blew me away. I had never heard anything about this. So it was all brand new to me and I'm really looking forward to the discussion tonight. Um, Sarah, Sarah, do you have any housekeeping things for us before we let Joan loose? Sure, I would just say I think we're probably all going to fit on the same screen tonight, which is good. Um, we are recording and we will be sharing um, with Lex Media, YouTube, the usual channels. So if anyone is self-conscious, um, you might want to turn your cameras off, but we'd love to see as many of your faces as possible. And I will try um, to keep it to speaker view if I can. Um, once we get the recording, occasionally Zoom does strange things. Um, so we'll see how that works. But we just want to thank you all for coming. And while the discussion is happening, just keep in mind if you're not talking, try and keep yourself on mute. Um, when we get to the kind of open ended discussion, you can raise your physical hand, use the little raise hand button. We'll see you. Okay. We Go good, for Sue? It, okay. Yep. Go for so it. So it, it's my pleasure to, to give a wonderful introduction to our guest speaker tonight on his book, Stolen, A Free Boys Kidnapped into Slavery and Their Astonishing Odyssey Home. Uh, Richard Bell holds a BA from Cambridge, a PhD from Harvard, and has won more than a dozen teaching awards, including the University System of Maryland Board of Regents Faculty Award for Excellence in Teaching, which is the highest honor for teaching faculty in the Maryland state system. He's held major research fellowships at Yale, Cambridge, and the Library of Congress, and is the recipient of the National Endowment of the Humanities Public Scholar Award. He serves as a trustee of the Maryland Historical Society as an elected member of the Massachusetts Historical Society and as a fellow of the Royal Historical Society. He lives in University Park, Maryland with his wife and two daughters and it's my pleasure to welcome him. Uh, here's the story. Uh, five boys kidnapped in August of 1825 in Philadelphia. Uh, four of them of the five were raised as free. Uh, Joe Johnson was 14. Enos is it Tigman or Tillman, age 10, Alex Menlov, eight, Cornelius Sinclair, 11, and Sam Scump, age 15, who was an escaped slave. So let's start. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the term, the reverse underground railroad, and then sort of give us an idea. We only know Philadelphia as a city of brotherly love, but we know from reading this book that it just wasn't all of that. And then can you tell us about Philadelphia and why it was so appealing for this type of slavery? Yes, yes, I can do that. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Joan, for that introduction. Thanks to everyone here who made this possible. So just so we're clear, my understanding is that we're talking to each other rather than me showing you slides and telling you uh, about why you should go and buy this book, because this is a book discussion group. And I think most of you have probably Read it. Are we on the same page, Joan? About well, what we're doing here? I, I have some questions for you, Richard, but if you have slides to show and however you want to do it is fine by me. I'd, I'd love to answer your questions. If I can find an opportunity to show a couple of slides as I'm talking, that'd be great, but it'd be nice, sure. to, be more, it'd be nice to be more spontaneous, but talking with you and other people rather than giving my pretty scripted um, 30, 30 minute uh, introduction. I'm assuming okay. most of you have read the book. All okay. right. That's not me, that's someone else doing that. Um, so Marjorie, I think that's you doing that, Marjorie. 
Uh oh. We've got your screen on, Marjorie. <laughs> the host should be able to you kill scroll that. Scroll down. Yeah. Sarah can fix that for us. Yeah. She's our mm -hmm. technical wizard. <laughs> All right, here I am. What was the question? <laughs> your, your, your screen's on, Marjorie. I know. How do I turn it on? Can you click the green button at the bottom of your screen? Uh, screen sharing. Yeah. Stop share. There we go. Yay. Oh, perfect. Okay. perfect. All right, everyone keep their hands so I can see them. Uh, <laughs> let's get into this. Um, so again, thank you, uh, everyone who made this possible. Um, Joan, thanks for those great questions as a way to open up this subject. So even folks who haven't made it through the book, I think can probably get something out of this conversation. So let's begin with one of the terms that appears quite a lot in this book. In fact, I think it's the name of the first chapter. It's called the Reverse Underground Railroad. Now, I hope all of us know what the Underground Railroad was, right? This is the famous network to freedom uh, by which uh, free people, whether they're white or whether they're black, would try to offer assistance of some kind or another um, to unfree people, to enslaved people trying to get free, trying to run from slavery. Harriet Tubman, of course, is the most famous conductor on America's Underground uh, Railroad. She's a former, she was a former slave herself. She escaped and then she went back to help other people. She did that 11 times. Extraordinary risk for a former slave to go back into a slave state to help other people get free. And she did it 11 times. Um, and she helped about, I think it's 70 people get free and she gave advice to 50 more. Like, what did, you, what did we do today, right? Uh, in comparison, so Harriet Tubman is an extraordinary American and she represents this phenomenon, this institution called the Underground Railroad, helping unfree people get free, usually by helping them get from the South to the North. Um, this book is about the opposite of that. This book is about the kidnapping and trafficking into slavery of free African-American children and adults, uh, usually from northern towns and cities like Philadelphia, but also Boston, New York, and other places you care to name. So this is done by professional people snatchers who look out for vulnerable free Black people living on northern streets and think that they can make a buck by passing them off as slaves and selling them to people who do not give a damn about where exactly they came from. And so um, I called this phenomenon, the kidnapping and trafficking of free black people within the United States into slavery, I called it the reverse underground railroad. Um, I'm not the only person that's called it that. That term pre-exists my book. If you Google it, you can find a Wikipedia page going back about 10 years. Um, so people on the internet, folklorists uh, as well, uh, have sometimes called this phenomenon of the kidnapping of free black people in America, the reverse underground railroad. They've also called it the other underground railroad. They've also had no name for it at all. I like the name reverse underground railroad because <laughs> it's provocative, isn't it? It's something that you might remember at the end of reading this uh, book. It makes you think, or it makes me think, gee, I know how the Underground Railroad work. I had no idea there was a reverse version where people could be kidnapped into slavery within America. And if the Underground Railroad was a big was a big deal, was the reverse Underground Railroad a big deal too? Were there a lot of people involved? And it turns out the answer is yes, that the kidnapping of free black people in America into slavery, it was not unusual, it was not terribly rare, it didn't happen just by accident to a few unfortunate people. Happened all the time. Uh, in the book, I guesstimate, and I'm, I'm happy to talk more about numbers, but I guesstimate that the number of people kidnapped, black people kidnapped into slavery within America is probably roughly the same size as the number of people who fled slavery on the Underground Railroad. So we're talking about tens of thousands of people between the revolution and the Civil War. If you want to think very simplistically, you could say that for every person who escaped slavery, there's a good chance another person was sucked into it. 
So that's the name, the Reverse Underground Railroad. And the Underground Railroad is very high profile right now. Uh, Jean's writing in the chat that she saw the movie uh, Harriet, which is this, uh, you know, Hollywood um, biopic uh, of Harriet Tubman, um, which I'm happy to talk about uh, too. There's been a big uh, TV series on Amazon Prime called The Underground Railroad based on a Colson Whitehead novel, um, which imagines that the Underground Railroad was not just a metaphor, but was actually real trains running under the United States, getting black people free. Um, fascinating stuff. It's confused a lot of teenagers, I think, about what the actual Underground Railroad was. Um, so I'm hitching my wagon, my star, to this very famous term and saying, well, if this is a good thing, then did you know it had a monstrous opposite, an evil twin brother um, that did some of the other stuff? So John, yeah, in, in that term, can you can you then sort of, have you found similarities or difference between the two, between the underground and the reverse? Yeah, so I think uh, in some ways they're mirror images, right? They're opposites of each other. If you, look, if you look at the direction of travel, Joan, for instance, most people who got free on the Underground Railroad are going from the South to the North. Most people being kidnapped are going from the North to the South and they're being accompanied uh, on each occasion, sometimes by American heroes like Harriet Tubman and sometimes by monstrous people snatchers doing this for money um, and for profit. If you look at how people make those migrations, on the Underground Railroad, there's a lot of secrecy, a lot of subterfuge, false papers, false documents, disguise. And it turns out that there's some very similar elements that kidnappers use to get free Black people into the slave system in the South. Um, so that's a inversion and a similarity. Um, and again, I, I said the scale, I think, is probably broadly similar um, as well. And when it comes to the journeys, um, if you look at some of the routes that people use to get free, some of the routes on a map, some of the roads, some of the voyages that they took, those are the exact same pathways of travel that kidnappers also used going in the other direction. So there are probably some roads in this country where freedom seekers going north are passing victims of kidnapping being forced to march south, if you can believe it. So it's not a perfect term. These two things are not absolute opposites and inversions, but there are enough similarities and enough resonances to get us all thinking uh, about this. It's supposed to be a generative um, term. Now I'm very bad about holding multiple questions in my head, but the next one that Joan asked was about Philadelphia, mm. um, if I remember correctly. Um, and yeah, this book begins in Philadelphia, though to some degree it could have begin, it could have begun in many other places too. This story could have taken place in Pittsburgh, in Cleveland, in Cincinnati, in Chicago, in New York, in Boston, for lots of reasons. All those places have good transport links to the south, either by land along that Mason-Dixon border, or by sea from ports like Boston and New York. Um, and it begins in Philadelphia um, for several reasons. One is that Philadelphia is a very large city. Um, if Boston's heyday is the 1600s, Philadelphia's is the 1700s and New York is the 1800s and onwards. But in 1825, Philadelphia is a massive city by American standards, by global standards too, actually. And it has the largest or co-largest with Baltimore free black population of any American city. Uh, I think the free black population of Philly is about 12,000 people um, at the time. That's a good basketball arena uh, full of folk who are legally free uh, for the most part, either because they've been born free or because they were born into slavery and their master chose to free them uh, or the laws changed in their states uh, after the revolution. Um, for all these reasons, Philadelphia has become um, a magnet actually for free black people from other places. If you get free in America between the revolution and the civil war, one of the places you often go is Philadelphia because so many other free black people are already there. Um, so think of it as like a, the, the capital of free black America, uh, if you want. Um, and 
the status of slavery in Pennsylvania is fading fast. Many, I'll back up. Before the revolution, every single state of the 13 colonies, every, thir every colony had slavery. Before the revolution, there was slavery in Pennsylvania, there was slavery in New York, there was slavery in Massachusetts, and everywhere else you care to name. But after the revolution, states north of Maryland take action to change that. Um, most of them pass laws called gradual abolition laws, which abolish slavery slowly, painlessly for the slave owners and very painfully for the enslaved people, but it works. So that the law passed in 1780 in Philadelphia in Pennsylvania to gradually abolish slavery means that by 1825, slavery is abolished in Pennsylvania. Massachusetts, by the way, does it very differently. Its legislators won't act to end slavery, but two enslaved people take their masters to court and the courts in Massachusetts rule in the favor of those slaves and achieve landmark rulings that declare slavery in Massachusetts to be unconstitutional with the state constitution. And so slavery dies in a courtroom in Massachusetts. In Pennsylvania, uh, it dies in the legislature, but it dies all the same. Uh, and so there's a large free black population in Philadelphia, and you might think that their lives would be pretty terrific now that they've achieved uh, freedom. And they're living, of course, in this large free black community. There's safety in numbers. You can go to church with people who look like you. You can live in neighborhoods with people who look like you, who know what your life is like and your culture. Um, and you're legally free for the most part. Um, and if I could add to that, um, Philadelphia is also the hub of the national anti-slavery movement at the time. Its state organization, the Pennsylvania Abolition Society, is one of the largest, one of the most vibrant. Arguably, it's the center of the anti-slavery movement. So in all these ways, you think Philadelphia would be a great place to be free and black. And it's certainly why so many people come there. Mm, but it turns out there are real limits, right? There are real limits on um, quality of life if you're free and black. And it's one thing to live in a place where slavery is illegal, but they certainly do not live in a place where racism is illegal. In fact, attitudes of white supremacy are prevalent in every American state, whether they've abolished slavery or not. 1820s America is not a post-racial paradise, whether you're in Vermont or whether you're in Virginia or anywhere uh, in between. And so what that means for these free black folks who live in Pennsylvania is that when they look for jobs, Joan, they have very limited opportunities. There's a lot of employers who won't hire black people or will only hire black people for the worst paid jobs that white people won't do. Uh, grave diggers, chimney sweeps and things like that. Um, that um, churches that black folk use get firebombed by local uh, mobs, we have evidence of this. Uh, there's a case where a black woman is stoned to death on the streets of Philadelphia, I think in the 1790s or somewhere around there. So you can be free, but you can still feel besieged um, by the civilian population around you. And so- I found, that, I found that very sad that, that these free black families couldn't trust anyone. They had no help from officials or, or officers or even just local um, solicitors. Or, they, they had no trust in anyone. It must have been a terrible time to, to be in that era. Yeah, I mean, I, I, some people say, wasn't the past great? I'd love to live in the 18th century or the 19th century. I think, no, I wouldn't. It would be just awful every day. And if you're black, that's doubly, triply. Um, true. The past is no paradise, folks. The past is no paradise, whether you're in Britain, America, Iceland, anywhere else. Um, so it's in this context, Joan, that kidnappers see an opportunity. Um, there are gangs of people who start to make their living kidnapping people from these free black neighborhoods in this free city, in this free state, and carting them off without ever going in front of a judge or anything like that into the slave South, getting as much distance as they can between that, um, between the loved ones that person has been forced to leave behind and going into the deep, deep South where there is huge demand 
for unfree black labor. The 1820s is the era when Mississippi, Louisiana, and Alabama are really exploding in prosperity and popularity. And while most of the people who are planting cotton down there who want to buy slaves are buying legally traded enslaved people that they've bought from slave owners in Virginia who want to sell some, demand is so great that kidnappers realize they can probably find a buyer who's not going to ask too many questions about where this terrified black person in front of them is actually from and going to turn a deaf ear when that black person says, I'm free, I'm free, I'm from Philadelphia, you can't take me. So there's a market for kidnapped uh, free black people. And of course, Philadelphia is so close to the slave states. In the 1820s, Philadelphia is a free city, but it's what, 20, 40 miles from Maryland, which is where I'm sitting right now, where I live, and Delaware, which is also in the same direction as well. And once you get into the slave states, it's just easier to get away with stuff like this. If you can get a free black person into Maryland, then you can get them into Delaware, into Virginia, into Carolina, into Tennessee, into Arkansas, into Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, and then you just gotta look for a buyer. And then you're off wow. to the races. Can you, um, I, I know there was an ad that had, had really touched you. Can you talk about the Boy Lost ad that you found? Yeah, in fact, let me, let, that's one of my slides, Joan. So why don't I go ahead and try and share my screen and find that slide and sure. just read it uh, to you. Because it's really short, isn't it? Let's find it. It's uh, right, here it is. I think right now you can see my slides. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is one of the, many, many, for me, astonishing discoveries that I made in the course of researching this book. Um, and I should have expected it, but I didn't. And what it is, of course, is a missing persons notice put there by one of the five boys at the heart of my book's father. His name is Joe Sinclair, Joseph Sinclair. And this appears in a Philadelphia newspaper, one of the cheap ones, about two, three days after his sons disappeared. And he's begging for help. Have you seen my son? It says, boy lost. The subscriber's son, Cornelius Sinclair, a colored boy about 11 years old, left his friends yesterday. And as he had no cause and had never before absented himself, it's feared he's been seduced away by some evil-minded person. My son is a very dark-skinned, mixed-race lad. He's pretty stout built. He's got thin, long fingers. His eyes are weak. His left eye is smaller than his right. Any person hearing of my son will confer a great favor on his afflicted parents by giving information to my employer at this address, Joseph Sinclair. And Joan, you may have heard me say this in other places, but I've read this ad, as you can imagine, dozens and dozens of times in my life, um, not least every time I talk about this book in public. And every time I do, those words, afflicted parents, they just jump out at me. They scream at me. I bet many of you are parents or grandparents. I've got an eight-year-old and a five-year-old in the next room watching My Little Pony right now. I don't recommend it. Um, <laughs> um, we're watching bubble guppies <laughs> they probably would love to <laughs> but the thought that you know anyone's children could be ripped away from them and all you could hope for is that someone would see your ad and would have seen something that may or may not put you on the trail just rips at me right is a very primal way as a, as a parent of children it reminds you that even though these boys these five boys sam enos alex uh, <clears throat> enos and joe these five boys are at the heart of my book i always try to remember the parents as well and try to figure out what they're doing or what they're going through as these boys disappear in front of their eyes one day in august of 1825 and um one never comes back as some of you know um, and the others that do, because there is a, a semi-happy ending to this particular story, the others that do are away for a long time, more yeah. than a year, which for these boys is a lifetime, of course. Sure. So correct me if I'm wrong now, but it, 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 from what I've read, your research took you over six years mm -hmm. through 35 archives, 14 states, including the District of Columbia. 
um, it must have been really difficult to try to piece this story together. And when you were trying to, to bring this story to life, did you find um, other documents or transcripts that really stuck out with you that, that you want to maybe talk about? Absolutely. Yeah. So imagine, I'm so glad I did it then and not now because COVID means everything is closed. Everything right. is closed. Right? I'm trying to research another book right now. Guess what? It's not going quickly uh, because everything is closed. So yeah, I began research for this and I'm happy to talk about how I came to this project if you're interested, but I came to this project back in about 2011 and I finished research in about 2017 or so and I was writing for a couple of years and then it took a long time to come out it came out in 2019 um right before the COVID times so this has been a big part of my life for the best part of a decade and the sources for this project were definitely not just waiting on a silver platter for some historian to roll up and gather them up and, and write a book this was been to use a metaphor needle in the haystack um stuff and, and you, you guys can probably figure out why that is right we're dealing with criminal activity uh we're dealing with kidnappers who are usually pretty good at their job which is not to leave a trace not to be detected not to be intercepted not to be interest arrested not to be convicted not to serve jail time and for the most part this gang is very good at its work so for that reason, all the legal records that you wish existed in massive quantities simply don't because this gang is too good. Um, so it's only when they do slip up that they leave a trace in legal records. Or we have you know, records from an anti-slavery group in Pennsylvania trying to track them down and failing. So that only tells us so much. Um, the central figures, the boys and their parents, most of them can't write, they're illiterate, which was very common for free black people at this time and very common for poor people in general at this time, but which they were also poor. So the idea that these boys are gonna leave diaries and letters describing their experience, or that the parents are gonna leave diaries and letters, it's, it's nonsense, they don't. So how do you write a story about people who don't leave traces? How do you write a true story? based on facts about people who don't leave traces. This was the hardest thing I've done as a professional historian is recon try to reconstruct this story. Mm -hmm. So you begin with the, I guess, low hanging fruit. Let me show you a couple more slides here, Joan, just to illustrate sure. uh, that. Um, mm -hmm. We begin, uh, I began with um, a cache of letters, about 50 of them, written to or from the mayor of Philadelphia, whose name is Joseph Watson, and who eventually, I would say belatedly, wades into this story, gets involved and actually tries to help, which is incredibly unusual for a white mayor of a major city in this time. Incredibly unusual. Right. His, yes. his, his predecessor, when confronted with similar cases, did nothing. His successor, when confronted with similar cases, did nothing. But this guy does something and because he does something and because he's rich and, and 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 powerful his sources survive you can find the mayor's mailbag and you can read it today his mailbag by the way is in an archive called the historical society of pennsylvania it's on 13th and locust it's open three days a week um go check it out next time you're in philly and whoops excuse me and the letters, um, there's about 50 of them that concern this particular kidnapping case. And it's pretty clear, um, by the way, that the parents have been up in his office and he sort of brushed them off. But then he gets this fantastic lead, a letter out of the blue from two white people in um, Mississippi who say, I've got some of your boys and they say they're from Philadelphia and they'd like to come home. Do you know anything about this? And the mayor's like, yeah, I heard about this last year and didn't do anything, but that starts a correspondence, which we still have. And so you can see the mayor's handwriting is not great, um, but it's not terrible either. I can read this just about, and I've been here six years. Um, so we have these 50 letters going back and forth between uh, a guy called um, John Hamilton and a guy called John Henderson, both in Mississippi and the mayor of Philadelphia. And that's long distance letter writing and those letters survive. Thank God they do. Um, yeah. 
And they also, we also have um, the printed copies of a small anti-slavery magazine called the African Observer that covered this disappearance when it actually happened and then continued to keep tabs on it when the mayor started getting involved. So we have basically some journalists cop out following along as well. Um, so I began with those, those sets of sources, the mayor's letters and the journalists' magazine pieces. And I didn't discover those. Historians have known about them for a long time, but on their own, if you only had those things, you couldn't write a book. And so no one had. And so I had to begin there and then sort of build on to this spine, lots of other sources that I thought could help me tell this story. That missing persons notice, where is it? Here it is, here it is, is one of those um, things I discovered which sort of added a bit of meat um, to the bone. But there were lots of um, others. One of the most amazing things I, d I discovered, and I got some help by the way, but one of the things I discovered, Joan, was a pair of letters written by one of the kidnappers. Oh. Something I thought couldn't exist, shouldn't exist, and wouldn't exist, but did. I found two letters written by one of the kidnappers in which, and I could not believe this, he names the other members of his gang and describes their specific roles in this specific kidnapping, which is one of dozens of kidnappings this gang participated in. And let me tell you, if you haven't read the book, then let me tell you why he wrote this. He was in prison. He had been convicted already of this kidnapping. He was one of the few dudes who actually went to jail after this and he wanted to get out. He wrote, uh -huh. he wrote clemency letters uh, begging the governor of Pennsylvania and the chairman of the Anti-Slavery Society to get him out. I'll give you what you want. I'll name names. I'll name my accomplices. I'll sing like a canary, but let me out because you know, you've got me, but I didn't really do much. I was really just the van driver. I wasn't the mastermind. It was the other people who were really guilty. I was just along for the ride. You can see how this is nonsense. Um, <laughs> but if you discount his own self-serving motivations for minimizing his own role, there's probably a lot of very useful information in the other mm. things he did. So these sorts of things I found incredibly useful. And in fact, in the back of the book, I even copied out, I think one of those letters so folks can read it if they ever wanna make it to the very back of the book. Uh, and then I'll make one other point, Joan, and then I'll stop talking. Um, <laughs> no, no, <laughs> don't stop talking. <laughs> oh no, okay, uh, I'll talk forever then. Um, <laughs> we, we have from the magazine, um, a transcript of a piece of testimony given in court in Philly by one of the boys after he gets home. After he gets home, he has his day in court and he says, these people did, it, did this to me, let me tell you my story. It's about 1300 words long. Sam Scomp is the guy who gave this testimony. He's one of the five boys. We have that testimony. We also have a similar testimony that I helped to find from Cornelius when he's in court in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, trying to get free. And these two testimonies are gold mines without which I couldn't write this book, but they're both very short. Each one is about 1300 words long. My book's about 70,000 words long. And frustratingly, neither Cornelius nor Sam, when recounting their story of their kidnapping and everything that happened next, neither of them say very much at all about the journey from Philadelphia through Maryland and Delaware, then Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi. They each say about 50 words. You think it was that. too painful for them? It's a, that's a great way to explain it, actually. That's a really good way to explain it. The, 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 the shadow of trauma over these boys is really yeah. large and ominous. Sure. Um, but I needed to tell readers what that journey was like. Uh, and their silence didn't help me do that. So um, the two chapters I personally am most proud of are, I think, chapters five and six. So the chapters in the middle of the book where I tell you what happened on that journey. And I wrote about 10,000 words about that based on the hundred words they told me. And so one of the things I had to do, even though I knew where they were going from and to, I had to tell the reader what that was like when they didn't tell me what it was like. So I was able to use sources from other 
yeah. enslaved people who'd been legally traded along those same roads and later got free. Um, you know, many ex-slave memoirs are written by people that have been sold from place to place. Um, Frederick Douglass, uh, for instance, uh, Charles Ball, uh, for instance, Josiah Henson. Um, we also have a couple of narratives of people who were kidnapped into slavery in America. Solomon Northup, who Sean's referencing in the chat, is by far the most famous example of this. And so we know what an adult man was feeling as he was moving across the country. And I tried to think my way from that into what a child might be feeling at the same time. We have business records from slave traders, not from kidnappers, but from slave traders. And they talk about how people behave when they're being held in captivity and marched 15, 15 miles a day every day for three months. Um, and they talk about what's on their minds as captors. And so I used all of that stuff. And then I also used one other source, which um, gave me an additional level of texture, color. I wanted to know what things looked like on the road. I wanted to know what the weather was like in a particular day in October in 1825 or whenever they were going through a particular place. What was the landscape like and stuff like that. So for that... I turned to the, the diaries of rich Europeans who went on long vacations to America to see the sights. This is like the opposite of the grand tour. Um, <laughs> rich Europeans would go to um, Boston, of course, and then they would go to Niagara Falls, and then they'd go to New York, and then Philadelphia, and then they'd uh, take stagecoaches or sometimes a steamer, they'd go to the Mississippi, and they'd end up down at New Orleans. And oftentimes, they would be in carriages on exactly the, the roads that I knew my boys had mm. been on. I'm not suggesting that they'd seen my boys, but I am suggesting they'd been on the same roads, sometimes in the same year or the same season or stuff like that. And so because these rich uh, Europeans are writing furiously about what a great vacation they're having with the intention of publishing their accounts when they go back to England for everyone to read, they always talk about what they see out their carriage window. And so I know what color the soil was in Tennessee in October. I know what the weather conditions are like when there's a lightning strike in Alabama in November, because these rich Europeans told me this stuff. And so that was extremely useful. And occasionally, these rich Europeans making these journeys would, of course, see convoys of enslaved people being marched to the south. Most of those convoys were probably legally traded slaves, but occasionally, probably, they were watching kidnapped people. They didn't know the difference from their carriages. But what they did know is what the, their faces, the faces of these black men and women and children looked like as they trudged past their carriage window. And each of these Europeans who saw convoys walking past, all of them, independently of each other, used the same metaphor to describe the looks on these black people's faces as they trudged southward. They all said, my God, they look like they're in a funeral procession. Mm. And, you know, I found that incredibly evocative uh, as a way to think about the state of mind of people trudging towards the harshest form of slavery anywhere in North America, which is Mississippi and Alabama in the 1820s. Um, were you, um, were you sorry, surprised? Gresh, hand up earlier. It might be relevant. Sorry about that. I saw Gresh's hand up earlier. It might be relevant to what we were already speaking about. Yes, uh, Richard, would you please uh, describe how important the fugitive slave law was? Because if it, if that hadn't been in being, could this have happened that way, the way you yeah. describe? Yeah, it's a great question, uh, uh, Gresh. So if I was going to put you on the spot, I would say, which fugitive slave law are you referring to? But the point I'm going to make to everyone is there are multiple fugitive slave laws. And the fugitive slave law is a piece of legislation designed to give owners of slaves, I call them enslavers, uh, full rights to track down runaway slaves anywhere in the United States they may be hiding and drag them back into slavery. It's a legal power to reclaim fugitives. So on the face of it, it has nothing to do with kidnapping of free black people. And before I go on and connect those two things, let me say one more thing. Um, the most famous Fugitive Slave Act is the one of 1850. 
So that happens about 25 years after the events in 1825 in my book. But before 1825, there's been two other very similar pieces of legislation. The original constitution of the United States, the one written in Philadelphia in 1787, has a fugitive slave clause in it. You can go read the original constitution and it says slave owners have the right to retrieve their runaway slaves anywhere in the United States they find them. Hmm. That was 1787. In 1793, the Congress actually tries to put some teeth on that actually quite vague piece of the Constitution uh, and articulates how that could happen. There are still some big loopholes um, in it, but it does mean that it's pretty clear that the federal government encourages slave owners to go and get their slaves um, back. And what that means, Gresh, is that by the 1820s, and even more so after that, there are plenty of kidnappers who like to be mistaken as slave catchers. There are plenty of people out grabbing legally free black people who, if anyone asks, will say, oh, this person who says they're free? Oh, no, he's a runaway slave. I'm taking him back to Virginia. And they thrive in that ability to be mistaken mm -hmm. for a slave catcher doing what's protected under the Constitution, um, if ever asked, which is one of the reasons so few kidnappers are ever caught or prosecuted in this uh, period, because by and large, they laugh it off and say, no, no, these are runaway slaves. <laughs> well, now I've lost the paperwork, but trust me, they're runaway slaves. Um, Things get even easier for kidnappers, Gresh, after 1850, so after the end of my book, when Congress passes uh, a new fugitive slave law, which is even more permissive to slave catchers and slave owners, makes it even easier um, to grab any black person living in the North and say, yep, this is a runaway slave, because... I tell you he's a runaway slave and I'm taking him back to Virginia. In fact, that law, Gresh, um, establishes what are called federal commissions in cities like Boston um, and New York, where um, any person who's grabbed a black person can go before this tribunal of federal commissioners, local appointees, and say, I'd like some paperwork uh, documenting that I've been before you and that the person I've got here is definitely a runaway slave. And so, of course, those federal commissioners have to adjudicate whether the terrified black person is actually a runaway slave who could and should be taken back to Virginia, or whether this terrified black person is legally free and is just being kidnapped. And so you'd think this would be an opportunity for justice, and you'd be completely wrong about that, because the law of 1850, the Federal Fugitive Slave Act, will pay those commissioners, those tin pot judges, five bucks per case if they adjudicate that the person standing before them is a free person who's been kidnapped and who should be released. But 10 bucks if they adjudicate that the person is definitely a runaway slave and can be on their way with their captor. So that creates moral hazard, as economists say. It means that for kidnappers, it's open season after 1850. Things only get worse when it comes to the vulnerability of black freedom in the North after 1850. And things were pretty bad already, as my book shows in 1825. Yeah. So while we're throwing around dates, Richard, you want to talk about the importance of 1808? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm a history professor, so I think everyone thinks about American history every second of their lives. But it turns out that's not true. Um, so this date is not nearly as well known outside of my head as it is inside my head. So let me tell you what, what happened in 1808. Um, in 1808, the United States government, President uh, Thomas Jefferson is the um, president at the time, passes a law um, outlawing US participation in the transatlantic slave trade. Now, as you all know, America has participated actively in the transatlantic slave trade in the colonial era under British rule, and it continues to do so legally after the American Revolution as well. But in 1808, the Jefferson administration says, no more, we're not gonna buy any more um, enslaved people from overseas, from Africa, from the Caribbean. Uh, and 
They don't do so for the best of reasons. If you think that Thomas Jefferson hates slavery, then you know very little about Thomas Jefferson. Um, there's lots of economic reasons why they do that. It's a way to actually financially benefit slave owners in the United States, in Maryland, in Virginia, in Delaware, who are looking to sell some of their own slaves uh, to planters in Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, and don't want the competition that the transatlantic slave trade would provide. So point is, it becomes illegal to buy enslaved people from overseas, and also harder to do so, even though smuggling continues after 1808. And so what that means, Joan, is that if you want to buy black people and put them to work in cotton fields in Louisiana, Alabama, or Mississippi, then you have to buy them from within the United States, by and large. Most enslaved people bought that way, are bought from planters in Virginia and Maryland and Delaware who are looking to sell about 20% of their slaves because they've stopped farming tobacco because it's no longer profitable and they've started farming wheat and wheat doesn't need as many slaves. They're looking to get rid of some slaves for that reason. Um, so that's the vast majority of legal purchases is of legally sold enslaved people from the Chesapeake. But of course, as I said at 10 minutes ago, um, demand is so high down in the deep south that uh, unscrupulous entrepreneurs willing to, willing to grab free people and pass them off as slaves, launder them into that domestic slave trade, see the opportunity of a lifetime. And the gang that kidnaps these boys is one of dozens and dozens of gangs that do this. Some of them are large and famous, like the gang that does this particular kidnapping. It's called the Cannon Johnson Gang, very well known at the time. But it's not the only gang. There are mom and pop operations, mom and pop kidnappers roaming all over America uh, in places like Philadelphia, uh, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Chicago, Boston, New York, etc. at this time. So they, they operate in the shadow of that legal domestic slave trade, which really takes off after 1808. Hmm. So were you surprised um, when the boys were rescued that it happened to be by Alabama slave holders? <laughs> were you were you kind of surprised when your research, when you found that was that was what was happening? Yeah. So plot twist, folks, uh, if you're just tuning in, um, five boys are kidnapped from freedom, which, as I've said so far, is not unusual uh, at all. What is unusual is that four of them come back and achieve their freedom by the end of this story. Outcomes like that, you know, I'm gonna call it a happy ending for lack of a better word, don't normally happen. Kidnappers are very good at their jobs. They whisk these people, sometimes adults, but more likely children, far, far away from their parents and loved ones, from anyone that can help them. And these children, these adults are often never seen again. You know, Solomon Northup, who uh, Sean mentioned in the chat, Sh Solomon Northup also escaped, but how long did it take him to do so? It took him 10 12, years, according to the, yeah, 12 years, 12 according, years according to the title of the movie, right? 12 years, right? So if an adult man who is highly literate and very well connected, if it takes him 12 years to get free, what hope do most boys and girls who are not literate and not well connected have to get free? None at all. And yet, four of these five boys achieve their freedom by the end of this book. So the outcome of this book is completely astonishing. Another way to say that, Joan, is that I couldn't have written this book unless so many strange things had happened. Because if it had ended the way most other kidnappings begin, it would have left almost no documents at all. But because a couple of individuals in Mississippi are moved to assist three of these boys, and because a couple of individuals in Alabama are moved to assist one of the other boys who's been separated from them, those four white individuals create a paper trail that allows me to tell this story and, of course, help the boys to help themselves. The boys are not passive bystanders in their own story. They're taking extraordinary risks every time they confide in someone or point a finger in court. But, but this is a very unlikely coalition. You might be asking yourself, you know, why would a couple of slaveholders in Mississippi, why would a couple of, what are they, Baptist ministers, Methodist, Methodist ministers um, in Alabama, why would they help? And one answer is, well, most people down there wouldn't 
help, of course, right? Um, even if you don't own enslaved people and you live in Alabama or Mississippi, then your livelihood is going to depend on slavery in some way. Um, if you're a minister, all of your congregants are going to own slaves or depend on slavery. So you can't be a crusading anti-slavery minister in Alabama and keep your job very long. You can't be an anti-slavery lawyer in Mississippi and get work. Um, so the reasons why these four men do the things they do are incredibly complicated. I'll do a bad job of summarizing them here, so I'm not going to do so. I will just say that one of the things I wanted to unravel in the book, Joan, was why these Southern individuals, these white people generally sympathetic to slavery, were moved to help these particular boys in these particular way. And you won't be surprised to learn that at root, there was a fair degree of self-interest uh, in, in, involved uh, here. They're not always operating out of the goodness of their heart, but to some extent, maybe that's true as well. So it's complicated, but without their help, um, these boys wouldn't have been able to battle their way back to freedom. The same is also true of the mayor of Philadelphia. If he'd not been the exception that proves the rule, the one guy in that office who gave a damn, we wouldn't have this book. We wouldn't have this story. The boy's bravery carries us a long way, but it doesn't push us across the finish line. They got lucky, didn't they? So, so yes, if, if being kidnapped is luck, but I know what you mean. I know what you yeah. mean, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, just one last question before I let everyone else chime in. Um, can you talk a little bit about what impact the case had, not only just for Pennsylvania, but also for Southerners in general? Yeah, so for Southerners, oh, wow. Okay, so let's build this up. Um, because of its unusual outcome, uh, Sam gets his day in court, and we get this extraordinary account in the newspapers of what it's like to be kidnapped from freedom. And that is seized on by anti-slavery activists who try to rub it in as many people's faces as possible. Read this. Isn't slavery terrible? Even free people, even free children can be swept up in this net. Um, and of course, if one child can be swept up, then any number of children could be swept up. Maybe even your children could be swept up and no one is safe from slavery. And so anti-slavery activists find a great deal of mileage in retelling or shining a spotlight on the suffering of black children. Uh, as this happens and after it happens. In the same way today, right, when you're looking at um, um, charity organizations trying to raise money to combat, say, famine in Africa or a hurricane in Haiti, they're going to show you a picture of a child. They're going to show you a picture of a child. They're going to try and pull your heartstrings, and that's because it works, by and large. And so this is a way to, to dramatize and humanize and weaponize this reverse underground railroad and get northern white civilians to give a damn. If you can't give a damn about children from your neighborhood being stolen away, then what sort of individual are you? And if I can get you to care about the kidnapping of free black kids, maybe I can get you to care about the enslavement of kids born into slavery in Mississippi that I can get you to join the anti-slavery cause. So this becomes a sort of cause celebre or a wedge issue as they try to build and expand the anti-slavery movement. More practically, Joan, it, it, it leads to a change in the law in Pennsylvania. Uh, the Pennsylvania uh, This is a challenge in court. Two, the case winds up in the Supreme Court of the United States, where that Pennsylvania anti-kidnapping law is overturned as unconstitutional in direct conflict with parts of the federal constitution. Uh, Southerners in Congress are worried that states might try to pass other anti-kidnapping laws that protect black people living within their borders in the North. And that brings us, Gresh, back to the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act, where congressmen try to pass a particularly fearsome pro-slavery law so that black people everywhere can never be safe. And many scholars, many, many scholars would argue that that law is a harbinger of the Civil War. 
Mm. But it sends people to their corners. It pisses off Northerners, something incredible. <laughs> um, and, you know, 10 years later, we're, we're at war. And I'll say one other thing. I'll just show you one other slide, Joan. Um, sure. I was mentioning... Uh, well, oh, where my slides gone? Uh, I was mentioning the anti-slavery campaign and the effect that it was that this particular case was uh, having. And I was saying that you know kidnapping becomes a sort of wedge um, uh, issue for the anti-slavery folks to sort of batter northern civilians with. Here's a visual proof of, of that. Um, this is a piece of anti-slavery propaganda. Um, mm. It's from the 1840s, I think. It's a children's anti-slavery alphabet designed to help teach kids that can't read to read good by teaching them little, little, little rhymes about the letters of the alphabet. The K in this anti-slavery alphabet, the K is the kidnapper who stole that little child and mother, shrieking it clung around her, but he tore them from each other. So we see here how anti-slavery activists are using the specter of are using the specter of kidnapping to mobilize Northerners to give a damn. And notice that it's not clear. Are we talking about the kidnapping of a free black person like Cornelius or Sam or Enos? Are we talking about a slave catcher grabbing a runaway slave? Are we talking about an African boy being dragged across the ocean? It doesn't tell us. The point is it's all getting mixed together as a monstrosity, as an evil that we shouldn't stand by and let happen on our watch. And that's one of the lessons of this case that people get animated about these atrocities by being confronted with such a specific atrocity, the atrocity that happens to these five children. Hope that makes some sense. Wow, yeah. that's pretty powerful. Yeah. So I have my questions I have gotten out there. Now I'm going to ask if any of you have any comments or questions for Richard. Uh, raise your hand and we could recognize you. And Richard, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, happy to be here. Thanks for those great questions, Joan. Thank you. Okay, everyone, your turn. Linda. Hi, um, Richard. You, uh, I learned so much from that book that I that I didn't know. Um, I, I thought one of the tragic ironies of the book this is, I guess it's a comment, it's not a question, was when the boys finally returned to Philadelphia after the trials and suffering that they had been through, Philadelphia hadn't changed. It was still the same city with the same racist attitudes. And from what you tell us, these boys lived their entire adult lives in poverty, and despair and discrimination. They just, they couldn't do anything but, you know, have the, the most primitive of jobs. And um, it, it just seems so unfair. Yeah, so, so you know, I feel bad now because that's such a great comment, uh, having called this a happy ending because, you know, compared to what, right? By <laughs> what measure is this a happy ending? What they get back to is a life where they're still, facing, despite everything they've been through, all the same sort of racialized restrictions and low expectations that they'd been kidnapped away from, spirited away from at the start of this story on their path into slavery. So um, Philadelphia has not changed, or if it has, I would argue it's gotten worse uh, by the 1830s and 1840s. Many historians would tell you that Philadelphia in the 1830s is a nadir, a terrible low point in America's uh, racial uh, history, even though we're dealing about fr a free city of, uh, where slavery is um, dead. You know, there are basically gangs of uh, white thugs uh, beating up black people on the street in Philadelphia. It's consumed by race riots in the 1830s. There are lots of reasons for this, but one of which is that the, the economy is not doing well and people are venting their frustrations by punching down, by punching people they regard as their racial inferiors um, there. So that's the city they return to, um, and that will continue. America, uh, Philadelphia doesn't suddenly get better, um, nor does any other northern free city. In the Civil War, for instance, um, there's um, a big riot in New York City uh, in 1863 in July, 
um, mm. which mark the fact that the Union Army is now conscripting um, white northern men into the army, whether they want to go or not. And in New York, uh, those white northern men who don't want to go riot against their service uh, in the Union Army, uh, especially now the Union is committed to abolishing slavery in the South. Um, and they don't want to go fight and die to free the slaves. They're not interested uh, in freeing the slaves. That's not their fight. And so when they riot in New York City in July 1863, who do they beat up? Free black people in New York to show the world that they don't want to waste their lives freeing the slaves in the South. They burn to the ground a black orphanage in New York, in the New York City draft right. Similar things happen in Philadelphia as well. And then after the American uh, Civil War, we see the rise of the Klan, the rise of segregation, all these other things. And that's not just a Southern phenomenon. It happens in many places. The Klan is born in Indiana, um, for God's sake. Um, so it's a reminder that this simple divide we have in our minds between the good North and the bad South, it's for us Northerners, and I lived in Massachusetts for seven years, it's for us Northerners a delusion. It's a lie we tell ourselves to make ourselves feel better. Um, the racial history of this country and of my home country, Britain, is very dark. And it's been very dark for a very um, long time. We should never put our, our heads in the sand and ignore that and just say, la da da, everything's fine. Because it's usually only white people who are doing that. Mm. Mm. Wow. Did you have some questions in the chat? I saw um, Jean had her hand up. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Jean. Um, I actually finished the book earlier today. <clears throat> I was really fascinated with it. Um, learned a lot of things I didn't know. I just had a comment. Um, of the, of the um, two women, the two Marys, who are joined to the boys in, in their, their uh, march, forced march south, yeah. one of them was actually a legal slave. Correct. And I thought it was fascinating. And she said, no, no, I wasn't kidnapped. I'm staying. And I thought, I mean, if I was her, I would have said, yeah, they stole me too. <laughs> and let them try to prove it. Um, the other thing was that, that was it Sam, the boy from New Jersey, who was an escaped slave. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he was an escaped slave. And even though he, he certainly had no business being kidnapped, no one did. But there... He, his legal status must have been a little bit wonky. I was so, surprised that, I mean, he, he, he actually apparently did go back to New Jersey, but not to, the, not to his master, of course. Just absolutely fascinating Pe people, it's just great. So yeah, so, so none of this is simple, right? So uh, we had to come up with a title for this book, uh, which was hard. <laughs> uh, and the subtitle we came up with was Five Free Boys Kidnapped into Slavery and Their Astonishing Odyssey Home. Um, and those words, five free boys, is that true? Is it not true? Um, first of all, there's two women in the story, none of whom, neither of whom make it into the title. Uh, of this book, Mary Neal and Mary Fisher, uh, one of whom, as far as we know, um, was a legally purchased slave, also being sold in the South. I think that she was in that cohort so that they could copy her papers and so create duplicate uh. copies with other people's names in, but I can't be sure. Um, and the other woman is a free black woman who's kidnapped, but she's not a child and she's not a boy, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And then one of the five boys, legally speaking, in the eyes of the United States government, is not actually free, right? He's a runaway slave, which is not the same um, thing. So those three words, five free boys, they collapse, they collapse. a lot of, I just heard some reverb there. Um, they collapse a lot of uh, nuance uh, there. I, I, I would I encourage you, try and come up with a better title if you can. Um, it took us a long time. Um, so I would say quite simply that Having worked six years in the archives on this, at the end of this, I was still left with plenty of questions uh, that I wanted uh, to know. Like, yeah, why on earth does she not claim that she's kidnapped when there's a good chance people will believe her? Um, why does uh, the other Mary linger on in Mississippi when she has a chance to go back? I speculated that she's because she's assaulted on the way down, but you can't prove that because she doesn't say that. So I have to sort of say it could have been, it might have been um, 
uh, that. What happens in the woods um, in Alabama or whatever it is when Sam gets free and the Native American drags him back? What is that interaction um, like? There's so many things we still don't know at the end of God knows how many years of uh, research. And just to pick up on a thread from the previous question and sort of tie them uh, together, I was definitely interested in finding out and then telling you as much as I possibly can about the lives of these four boys after they returned to Philadelphia. Joe doesn't survive, but the others do. Um, and I wanted to be able to tell you what their post-kidnapping lives were like and that they lived to a grand old age, had grandchildren, everyone was happy, lived happily ever after. And if you've made it to the end of the book, you know that there are things I can tell you about what those lives were like. And there were things which still have big question marks over them. A couple of boys seem to basically disappear. Mm. Does that mean they die? Does that mean they keep their heads down in a city where black people only end up in legal records when something bad has happened? Is it good that we can't find them in the legal records or is it bad? Um, can we not find them because I haven't looked hard enough? Can we not find them because the civil war came along and destroyed libraries and archives across the nation? We don't know. What I can tell you is what I did. Um, I did everything in my power to find them. And I, I found plenty of things, all of which I put in the book. But I was still very, um, you know, humbled by all the things I didn't find out and all the questions I had. So I took the extraordinary step um, and historians don't often do this, of hiring other people to see if they could do better than me. Um, I hired three other historians or genealogists um, to see if they could follow these boys after they got back to Philadelphia and find out different things or better things than I could. Um, I hired a guy who specializes in African-American genealogy. Um, his name is Reginald Pitts. Um, I hired a person who worked at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania and knew the Pennsylvania records inside and out. And I hired someone uh, with a background in genealogy who lives in Salt Lake City, which if you know anything about genealogy is where the Mormons have created this incredible archive for all Americans um, about genealogy. And all of them dug in and I paid them for their work, by the way. Um, they weren't just doing this for the love. Um, and they all came back with small handfuls of things that I hadn't found and they had. And because I paid them for their work, those things are also in the book you've read. This is the collective wisdom of four scholars for those two pages. That's all we know. And of course, at the end, there's still these questions. Um, so I blame the Civil War for destroying all the records. Um, I blame poverty and I blame racism um, for making it hard to follow free black lives in Philadelphia. And I blame myself, of course, for not being a better historian. But um, I'm not sure which version you read. Um, if, if you guys read the hardback or the Kindle or the audiobook, um, it tells an ever so slightly different tale than the, that's the hardback. Yeah, uh, it tells an ever so slightly different version than the paperback. The paperback is over... The paperback has two bursts on it on the front, on the left and the front, right. Um, and that's because about six months after the hardback came out, one of my friends read the book. He'd read the manuscript, but then he read the book. And the second time he read it, something jumped out at him. And my friend, his name is Elliot Drago. Uh, he's an historian of um, black life and the police in Philadelphia in the 1830s. And he said, wait a minute, this is ringing a bell this time. Your guy, Sam, I've seen his name before. I've seen his name in a police file. And I said, but I've read the police files up through 1835. He's not there. And he said, well, have you read 1836? <laughs> Sam, I think I have my years right, roughly right, 1836, 1837. Uh, Elliot uh, had found one reference, one reference uh, to Sam, Sam Scomp also known as Sam Hill, uh, in a police file in, I think, 1836 or 1837. Uh, and it was the most bizarre reference you'd ever find. He was accused of assault and battery um, because he'd beaten up uh, a member of a crowd, um, which was part of a race riot. He'd beaten up someone he took to be a white supremacist. 
in a race riot, which was awesome, right? This black guy beating up on a white supremacist in a white supremacist led race riot that he was fighting back in. (laughs) But the twist is the guy he beat up was actually a peace loving Quaker who'd infiltrated the white supremacist mob and he beat up the wrong guy. No. (laughs) Can you make this up? You can't make this up, right? It's too nuts. No one will believe you. Wow. So if you've read the paperback, there's one paragraph, just one, that's different. And it tells you that story very different, very briefly. And of course, what it means is that in the hardback, uh, I speculate. And I'm very, it's very clear that I'm speculating that Sam might have gone back to New Jersey to see if he could help get members of his family to walk out of slavery. And I now know that didn't happen. At least it didn't happen in 1836 because he's still in Philly then. But that's the only substantial change. But it's entirely possible that if I keep talking about this to enough people, that one of you is going to say, hold on a minute. I know something else. And I love talking to Black audiences about this, of course, because the chances that I might run into someone whose family history intersects with this always rises uh, when I do this. So I'm always happy to speak to anyone and everyone uh, about this story in case I can make it more accurate, more truthful um, going forward. Stay tuned for volume number two. Yeah, yes, indeed. Sarah, did you have some in the chat? Yes. uh, Um, 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 You just mentioned it. What are, what are the differences in the reactions of a black audience and your lily white audience here? <laughs> uh, I mean, um, I grew up in Pennsylvania outside of Philadelphia, and I, I ne- to me, the Mason Dixon line was the line between good and evil. Uh, and then I went to the University of the South in Swanee. Oh, you know, I know that place very well. Yes. Okay. Well, I'm a graduate. Uh, back before, well, the Lost Cause was was still alive, probably in 1964. Um, so, what is the difference between audiences of of whites and of color when you would talk to them about this wonderful book? Yeah, I don't want to paint in broad brushes because I think for the most part, I haven't observed significant differences along uh, complex you know, racial lines. Um, I would say that, you know, uh, most people who are not professional historians uh, are often surprised to learn about some of the things that went on uh, back before the Civil uh, War. Um, Northerners are often surprised by this racial climate I'm describing in Philadelphia back in 18. 18- um, 25, regardless of whether, you know, who, who's in the, uh, who's in the audience um, there. On the other hand, now and again, um, I would say that people who have heard of the kidnapping of free black people before are more likely to be African-American people of uh, color. Um, people who've seen Solomon uh, Northup uh, movie, 12 Years a Slave, uh, perhaps more likely to be people of uh, color, um, you know, the direct connection to their own, you know, lives and family and culture is really uh, obvious. I would say, of course, there's a direct and obvious connection to, you know, white lives and culture as well here, right? Um, this is a story about Americans doing terrible things to e- each other. Uh, and we're all part of that legacy um, uh, here. Uh, I think uh, it's weird that I sometimes get the sense that people think it's weird that a white person is telling this story. Um, But I try and brush that off because I think this is America's story. I don't think that um, white people ignoring this stuff is helping anyone uh, at all. So I think it behooves all of us as Americans, as citizens to pay attention to how this country became the country. uh, it is. So I'll just stop there. Uh, and someone's raised, uh, looks like his hand. Do you want to uh, talk? Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Sean. Um, so I, uh, I appreciate the conversation. And as the, uh, the uh, lone non-white person uh, here, um, <laughs> I'll say hello, um, but also to um, this idea of of a reverse underground railroad. I think that, um, as I mentioned in the chat, 
that that would really change the conversation um, about 12 Years a Slave and about what it meant to be in a country where you have these different degrees of freedom, um, regardless of whether or not you're on, you know, in a northern state or a southern state. So could you talk a little bit about um, where you see this idea of a reverse underground railroad going in terms of getting more out there into uh, common knowledge and what impact that will have on, on, uh, on professionals like yourself and for um, you know, folks who are interested in history like, like those in this uh, book. Yeah. book. Yeah, Sean, I find that really hard to answer because I don't know, actually, right? I'm, I'm really bad about, you know, talking about the present day and the future. I have enough trouble with the past, if, if I'm quite honest. Um, so I'm really bad at uh, having a crystal ball and making predictions. You should have heard my political predictions for the presidency in 2016. I was so, so wrong about who the next president was going to be, uh, even who the Republican nominee was. I was wrong like six times. Uh, so... Don't take my word for anything when it comes to this. Um, I, to bring that, you know, that brings us back nicely, Sean, to one of the first questions that I think Joan asked me about this term. Um, I wanted to make sure that this phenomenon, the kidnapping and trafficking into slavery of free black people within the United States had a name and that people who read this book remembered that name because um, things need names and arguably they need to be memorable uh, names. And I thought reverse underground railroad, which is a term I did not come up with, but when presented to me, I think I judged to be the best candidate, served that purpose because it provokes you, right? It, uh, it needles you, it gets into your head a little bit and begs questions. You do, you, you're trying to think, well, how does that work? Is it the opposite? Is it as significant? Why should we care? Why didn't I know this before? These are the sort of reactions I think people have when they hear that term. Um, and they want to know, is it just me who didn't know this term or did everyone not know that term as well? Um, so I like those sort of reactions. If it makes you curious or even sort of, you know, FOMO, fear of missing out that everyone's been using this term and you didn't know it until 10 seconds ago, that's a reaction I lean into. Um, I, I want to say for the record that, you know, among historians, the fact of kidnapping of free black people is not news. Um, I didn't discover this and say, oh my God, fellow historians, did you know this happened? Because they would have said, yes, we knew this happened. Um, look at the 12, look at 12 Years a Slave. It won the Academy Award for Best Picture in like 2011 or something, right? If you saw the movie, you know this happens. But one thing that the movie did not do a good job of, and it's a wonderful movie. I love the movie. Everyone should see it because it's going to make you insane with rage. Um, mm. One thing the movie doesn't do a good job of is, is setting what happens to that guy, Solomon Northup, in any sort of context. We get we could walk away from that movie thinking that he's the only American that ever happened to. Um, mm. Because almost everyone else on the plantations he ends up with are legally bought uh, people. Like the Lep Lupita Nyong'o character, Patsy, who's a real person, she was legally traded, right? She's not a victim of kidnapping. Not, very few people on that plantation are. So is what happened to Northup just, you know fundamentally bad luck the poor guy wish it hadn't happened but we'll move on because he got free and my research for this book which was focused on this particular kidnapping case the case of these five boys um required me to delve into the context for this and figure out why it happened to these boys and that produced unquestionable mountainous evidence that it was happening all the time uh, I personally could document hundreds, maybe thousands of these cases, and I was not looking for other cases. I was looking for this one. If I spent my life looking for other cases of kidnapping, I could come back to you on my deathbed with shed loads, storage lockers full of evidence um, uh, for this. Mm -hmm. So I want you to think of it in terms of systems, right? That it's not just one thing that happened, it's an example of a system of exploitation against uh, free black people that was not very coordinated, um, was very haphazard, but affected massive numbers of people. We know that every free black person living in these Northern cities was daily aware of the fear, the possibility of losing their freedom, of being kidnapped, that free black parents in cities like Philly 
when their children leave the house every morning or, or when they go out to work, they're always wondering, will I see my child again? Mm. Uh, they're warning their children, don't talk to strangers. Um, don't go down alleys with people uh, you shouldn't. Stick in groups, learn how to read body language. They're afraid because they know their freedom is fragile and they know that kidnappers stalk these places. So I want people to walk away from this book with some of those same um, conclusions. I want them to sort of think more critically about the line between the good north um, and the bad south. Um, and I want them to realize that, uh, and I hate to sound so sort of depressed about this, that, uh, you know, racism in American history uh, mm -hmm. is not limited to its expression in slavery. It's not limited to the slave South before uh, the Civil War, that like in Britain and many other Western European democracies, it's been a feature, an essential feature of, uh, of modern life for an awfully long uh, time. Hmm. Wow. Uh, or, or in happier news, Sean, um, there are uh, TV producers interested in the show, so there might be a TV show at one point. Good, because one of the things that I was surprised as you were talking about uh, how how, how um, common it was, unfortunately, that uh, I was doing some research on a, a free black family in Lexington. Yeah. Uh, they had been emancipated in the 18th century and one of their grandchildren was kidnapped um, in the uh, early 1800s in New Orleans and the governor in, uh, it intervened um, and, and, and gained his freedom. And I, and I thought that was rare, but now uh, you're saying, no, no, that was. And so this idea of that, 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 that danger of getting work on the wharf in these seaports, and then that not only being a place of employment, but also a place of danger, because it's easier for you to be uh, Shanghai before the term was uh, was was, yeah. was uh, used in the West Coast. Yeah, right. Places of opportunity. He'll give me some uh, a quarter to help me unload some boxes. That opportunity is also the greatest threat you've ever faced. You don't know who to trust to come back to something Joan said uh, at the start, right? So imagine living in that sort of fear. I'm a very overprivileged white person. I will never know what it's like to live in that daily fear. Um, but we should all consider that possibility of what it might feel like. Is there anything else in the chat? You know. I think we're up um, to date uh, in the chat. Sean's just, yeah. you know, um, pulled pulled out some of those themes from his comment. Oh, good. I did have a um, a question um, on my end of um, if it would be possible. I don't know how much is you know under copyright or anything like that, but um, would it be possible for us to view the images that you were showing us after the fact? Oh, sure. Um, yeah. How about uh, someone from uh, Lexington Historical Society reach out to me? I'll respond with a PDF version of my slides. Uh, what you'll notice is they're just um, higher, higher resolution copies of the images from the book, right? So uh, if you were like, oh, this is black and white and grainy, I can show you a color version in higher quality, um, but you won't see any new images, I think, um, in that slideshow. But happy to share that if someone reaches out. That would be great. Okay. And if um, anyone has any further questions, is it okay if they contact you directly? Oh, absolutely. I'm going to put my email address in the chat right now, in case you guys can see the chat. Um, I'm very easy to find, by the way. If you just want to Google Richard Bell, Maryland, which is where I teach, you'll also find my email address immediately. But my email address is rjbell at umd.edu, rjbell at umd. Dot edu. Uh, I think you guys will have the book, but if anyone wants to get a signed copy, don't hesitate to reach out and I'll be happy to sell you one or your uh, uncle one or your, your grandchild one. Uh, always got a stack of books waiting to be signed and shipped out. But I want to thank all of you for reading this thing. It's so nice to talk to readers. Uh, well, thank you for book. joining us, Richard. And, and please keep us updated with uh, new projects and please check out his, his website and future lectures and webinars. He's, you, you can't get enough of Richard Bell in my, in my book. Believe me, I, I've enjoyed everything I've heard oh, from him. Kind. I've just put my website in the chat as well if people want to see it. It's richard-bell.com. Let us know about your next project. Well. Great, thank you. I appreciate that. All right, folks, I'll let you get back to your loved ones. Uh, thank you for so much for these questions and for pushing me on this stuff. It's been a pleasure 
to talk to you and I hope you're all happy and healthy and we can get back out in the real world sooner rather than later. All Thanks right, so much, so Richard. Much. Take care. Good night. Thank you very Thank much. You. Good night. Thank you. Everyone. Bye. Okay, Sue, Excellent. back to you for our last comments or whatever. Yeah, well, um, I think that was great. And I'm always happy to read a book about something that I've never even heard about before, not just a, a nuance of something that we've studied and a new aspect or something, but this is a whole subject I didn't really know about. So I'm happy about that. Um, our next session will be on March 22nd, and we're doing something we've never done before. So, so I hope, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to the discussion on that. Uh, the book is called The Only Woman in the Room, and um, it is about the life of Hedy Lamar and her scientific activities. But the extraordinary thing about this is that it's written as a novel. And we've never done that before in the book club. So I'm anxious to see, get your reaction to the format. And uh, hopefully we'll learn a lot from that as well. So that's March 22nd. Look forward to seeing you then. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Great program.